Thank you. Um, we're really excited to have everyone here. Uh, my name is Tom Hiles, and I'm a vice president at Grinzenbach Glear. And I want to thank you for joining uh, myself and GGNA fundraising expert Rod Kirsch on a session called Navigation, Navigating Campaigns to a Crisis. Um, it's our belief that any period of eight to 10 year campaign, it's not a matter of if, but when you're going to experience some kind of controversy or crisis. So this is a session intended to uh, hear from some experiences at Penn State and University of Missouri. Rod and I will give a brief overview of our uh, situations at Penn State and Mizzou, and then we'll address the topics that, was that were mentioned in the marketing flyer. Uh, please feel free to use the Q&A button, and we will try to address as many questions as possible. And finally, um, we'll uh, uh, try to stay on a little bit after 1230. Uh, if people are interested in going on, Rod and I are glad to continue answering questions after that. So with that, let me turn it over to Rod to kick off um, our session on introducing Penn State's situation. Rod? Uh, thank, thank you, Tom. Uh, so I was just finishing my 15th year as a senior vice president for development and alumni relations at Penn State when uh, without any warning at all, uh, we experienced uh, the, uh, uh, the throes and the aftermath of a child sexual abuse scandal that really turned our world upside down. A former football coach uh, had been arrested and indicted on 48 criminal charges related to the abuse of, uh, of boys and young men. Um, within about three days time, uh, two university officials uh, had been indicted on perjury uh, before, the grand, before the grand jury that had done this investigation. A popular uh, university president had been removed from office. An iconic coach uh, was fired live on national television. Our governing board leadership had changed um, and clearly Penn State's darkest days were ahead of it. Um, this uh, incident occurred about halfway through our $2 billion campaign. Um, so we were left with a stunned donor constituency, um, pretty shell-shocked staff, uh, a stream of lawsuits uh, that uh, proceeded over the next several years, uh, credit rating downgrades, constant media scrutiny, which began the week of the, um, uh, the crisis began. We had over 400 media in, uh, in our uh, community and 16 satellite trucks, uh, which no one had ever seen before uh, in, in our place. And uh, really an overwhelming uh, sense of, uh, of uh, uh, anxiety and crisis that went on actually for literally for several years. Um, the story does have a positive end as it relates to fundraising and we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. So Tom, I'll uh, ask you to talk a little bit about what you experienced at Mizzou. Thanks Rod, thanks Rod. So I came to Mizzou in 2012 to kick off a, uh, to begin a, a $1.4 billion campaign that eventually became that. So our quiet phase was 2012 to 2015. We got a new chancellor in 2014 and he was in the midst of doing kind of a honeymoon period when in the summer of 2015, many of you will remember um, the Ferguson incident when uh, Michael Brown was killed. Um, so that led to a series of um, racial sort of discussions uh, around race and race relations at Mizzou. Um, we, it, it, there were several incidents on campus during that fall of 2015, which is, by the way, the same time we were planning to kick off our campaign. Um, so a student government president uh, was called the N-word. There were several other um, email controversies. At the same time, it wasn't just about Ferguson and the aftermath of that. We had graduate students who uh, were told that they no longer could get health insurance, which led to a huge backlash and then a reversal of the decision by terrible publicity. We had a Planned Parenthood controversy where our uh, hospital was told that they could no longer do uh, privileges at a Planned Parenthood session that led to a whole group of additional um, protests. Uh, then there was a dean's uprising where the deans uh, told the new chancellor they didn't like him and there were a lot of issues around that and communications with the new chancellor. 
And then uh, later in the fall, the demand for the president of the system to resign. There was an incident at homecoming. Um, and the, at the same time, the deans were uh, demanding the chance to resign. Uh, so we kicked off our campaign in October of 2015, and it was magnificent. We had a $25 million gift. Uh, Cheryl Crow made a surprise appearance at the campaign uh, event. And three weeks later, on November 15th, uh, began a series, or the week of that, November the 15th, uh, the students had set up uh, protest tents and were sleeping in the quad right outside my office. Uh, a hunger strike occurred by one of the graduate students who said he would not eat again until the president resigned. And then the football boy, um, uh, threatened football boycott that unless Tim Wolf resigned that uh, the football team would not play their next football game. It got increasingly from a local story to a national story. And as Rod alluded to, we had to the Today Show and in CNN Live and all around the world that week. Uh, the, the last thing that happened was a journalism faculty member, Melissa Click, was uh, seen yelling at students uh, call and asked for muscle to come in and take these students out or media, excuse me, media out of the area. We're a pretty important journalism school that caused a huge viral uh, video backlash from that incident as well. So uh, as Rod alluded to, we uh, started dealing with a whole host of communication crisis along those lines. So that kind of frames it. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the things that we did in each of the crisis going forward. So um, with that, again, I wanna remind anybody that was coming in late, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A session and we'll try to monitor that as we go along. So Rod and I are gonna take turns um, addressing uh, some of the things that we put into our session. First um, issue is around the importance of developing a rapid response communication process in crises. So, I'll show you in a little bit in a little bit a heat map that we kept for all the different kinds of crises that we were dealing with. People were upset about Melissa Click, or they were upset about the the uh, racial protests, etc. So we were monitoring all those different pieces, and as Rod experienced as well, we literally got thousands of email questions, complaints, etc. That we were dealing with call phone calls. And so we quickly realized in order to address these, we had to develop a rapid response approach, which we developed in a green, yellow, red approach. Red was, you gotta get the information out today, like within the next hour or so, because this piece of data that's come in is so important to get to our donors first and our principal gift donors in particular first that we need to let them know. Uh, yellow was, it needs to get out this week, and green is, well, this is a good thing to communicate as we can. Um, and that was really uh, our first approach to try to address those issues. And we literally had um, a team of people who were either responding to the email questions or complaints and um, the phone calls that we needed to return from folks. And then we were uh, addressing the third category, which was donors who threatened to pull their gifts and pledges. We had about $8 million in pledges pulled within the first two weeks that we had to go in and try to work through. So um, those were the sort of areas we were dealing with. And again, it was all hands on deck in that first 10 days. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of how we addressed it. I'm gonna let Rod now address um, how they dealt with that at Penn State. Yeah, so I would say that, you know, being responsive and, and being responsive immediately is, is really a key fundamental of trying to deal with a crisis. It's probably, you know, uh, uh, the first page of the first chapter of any crisis book. Um, in our case, uh, we did not have any substantive institutional response uh, for nearly four days. Um, and when that happens, the media will fill that, that void, that gap of, of information if, if, if you don't as an institution. 
And in that kind of context, the media then develops uh, its own narrative uh, by talking to people around the edges or whoever they can get to, to go on record. Um, so that's uh, you know, controlling the message and having a single spokesperson and doing it immediately is really important. Um, we, were very, we tried to be as transparent as we could once the incident took place. Uh, Penn State, uh, you know, in a fairly short order, set up a special website that was devoted uh, particularly to the crisis and all the attendant uh, issues related to the crisis. Uh, so it was a public site that anyone could go to for, it had Q and A's and so forth, which was, was very helpful. Uh, I was a big advocate, uh, took a little bit of bruising uh, for it, uh, but uh, was a big advocate of the alumni magazine uh, being um, a conveyor of what, uh, you know, both the good and the bad news. Um, and when crises uh, of whatever magnitude happen, uh, people know that there's bad news. And so you really can't be disingenuous and just go on like, you know, life is normal and everything's going well because that's not the reality. And so in order to retain integrity with your leadership, and we know from lots of surveys that still to this day, even though we've got a lot of digital communication, alumni get, uh, they, they still look to their alumni magazine as the best single source of information about their institution. So we were very candid uh, in our alumni magazine, starting with the very first issue that we published after the crisis began, which had a black cover to it. Uh, and at the very bottom of the black cover, the masthead of the magazine was uh, the letters were, were, were uh, crumpled up on the bottom. Um, there's, you know, uh, what, what we ended up seeing is about three quarters of, the, of our alumni felt that that really um, summed up how they really felt about uh, their, their emotion and passion about it. Um, we had about a quarter of the people thought that that was inappropriate. Um, the last point I'd say here is that um, there's a real difference between a crisis management plan and an emergency management plan. The emergency management plan is, you know, when you have a, a fire in the chemistry lab or there's food poisoning on campus or perhaps even a shooting on campus. Um, uh, crisis management is a, is, is a different beast. Um, and in our case, uh, unfortunately, the university had excellent emergency management plans uh, but didn't really not have a crisis management plan. And so it even took uh, some period of time until word got out to all of our board of trustees about what had occurred and to bring them together. So Tom, I'll kick it back to you. Yep. And so just uh, another nuance off of the communications theme is around principal gift donors. Obviously with your top 200 to 300 donors, you can't take a, a general um, university email and send it to them and expect a good response. So one of the things that I think I did well, uh, there's a number of things I, I think we made mistakes on, but early on I realized even on the day of the announcement of the resignations that we were getting such a flood of questions, what's going on kind of things that I determined that at three o'clock that afternoon, I sent out, we sent out a group email to our cab campaign cabinet, our principal gift donor list, and um, various volunteer groups said, I'm going to be on a call at three o'clock. I'll tell you what I know. And again, we weren't, and I think Rod experienced this as well, we weren't getting a lot of central clarity around communication messages. Like here are the talking points. When you're in the middle of a crisis, everybody, there's a vacuum of information. Everybody's scared to share anything. So I took some risks doing that, but it was really critical. And people, we had about 85% participation, uh, just giving people two hours notice. We wanted 85 to 90% of our donors tuned in because they wanted to know what the hell was going on. So that was something we realized was really important to do. And as the crisis continued over the next several weeks, um, we made a determination, and this cascaded down to the deans, to the athletic director. We came up with a process that said, reach out to your top 25 and do the same thing that we did. Say, here's what I know. Here's what we can share. And um, that proved to be a very important um, launch pad into building trust by just communicating what we could know, what we knew, because there were so many changing viewpoints. And there were some volunteers who felt there was no racial animus 
and there was no issue at Mizzou and this was all contrived. And I had to tell them, look, you know, if you want to see some of my emails, I will tell you that we do have an issue and we have some problems. At the same time, we wanted to reassure people that we were going to move forward and try to address their questions. So th that was an approach we took, a top 25 by each college, by our principal gift list and said, hey, we're going to have regular um, sorts of uh, phone communications, emails to let you know what we know. And we did that for several months after the crisis ensued. So Rod, I'll turn it over to you for- Yeah, I think communications with donors is really tremendously important. I, and I see there's a question in, in our, in, in our Q&A uh, uh, about how we dealt with uh, uh, the concern donors would have about using their funds uh, for any kind of legal costs or, or settlement costs as it was the case. And, and uh, we actually made uh, statements uh, several times and put in writing to donors that we would not use gift funds uh, to cover any of the associated costs. Uh, I actually asked uh, a, a law firm to develop uh, a language that we could put into any kind of gift agreements, uh, be it for a, a capital gift or an endowment gift that would guarantee that. Um, we actually did not have a lot of kickback on that and we did not end up using that language. Um, uh, people essentially believed what we said that gift funds would not be used to cover these expenses. And indeed, we kept our word on that. Um, I, I would I'd encourage all of you, if you're whatever kind of stress your organization might be under, and, and Tom and I had some, you know, kind of, you know, um, uh, AAA level, uh, you know, crises here to deal with. But, but uh, please consider using your volunteers as a voice. Um, I was blessed with, uh, with really some great volunteer leadership, particularly our campaign chair, who a man of great integrity. And so we used uh, we used his voice and messages from him uh, very continuously. Uh, what I would say in terms of again communication is focus on your mission. Our campaign was called the Campaign for Penn State Students, and we found that uh, tremendously helpful to actually go back to that message that your gifts are going to be protected. Uh, and they're going to be uh, advancing the interests of students. Uh, and so we did have a little bit of gift attrition um, out of a, what ended up to be a, a $2.2 billion campaign. We lost about $8 million of gifts um, uh, that had been pledged and, and pledges canceled. We also uh, had a great partnership with the Alumni Association in the context that we also, in terms of communication, we wanted to mobilize Penn State now has over 700,000 alumni. We wanted to mobilize many of those alumni. So we put together a, a list of 26 separate distinct actions that any alumnus could do uh, to, uh, to help uh, rebuild uh, the reputation of the institution. Uh, and then the last thing, and I'll just uh, reinforce what Tom said, we, we got what, who was then the, the, the new president, got him on a, quite a number of, of conference calls, investor calls, if you will, uh, to talk to key uh, volunteers, uh, to talk to key uh, major donors and so forth, uh, to keep them apprised. So lots of things I think you can do around communications, critically important. So Tom, I'll pass it to you. Yep, so this, is a, this third bullet is a critical category of dealing with governing boards, as well as staff and staff morale. So. I think generally Rod and I experience, and I think you will find this as sort of a universal during a crisis like this, is when there's a vacuum, the governing board wants to fill it. And by that, I mean, they start getting into counting the paper clips. They will uh, start getting involved in decision-making personnel, other kinds of areas. And so, because they're getting inundated from their uh, customer base and friends, with what, what's going on there, why don't you do something? They do something. And that's usually trying to get in to deal with operations. And so communicating with them, I, was, uh, I, I got in trouble from one of the curators for um, communicating some information, which wasn't all that positive to principal gift donors because I had been yelled at earlier from a principal gift donor that we didn't get information out enough on bad news. And yet the governing board person is wanting to know why we're sending bad news out. So you're trying to find that right balance. But in general, I think um, you will experience this and hopefully a president and other senior leadership can 
jump in and try to address those issues. One of the things that both Rod and I experienced were they brought in crisis communication marketing teams from outside. They were a guru marketing firm and they're gonna help solve all your problems. We had about five of those in the first five months. And as Rod and I feel like we know our situation better than they do, we can always learn from consultants, but we did not necessarily um, uh, want to have that ongoing governing board oversight on the communication side. Uh, addressing staff morale, I just briefly said the best thing I did was I brought Rod Kirsch in to address our team because uh, Rod had worked with my former chancellor at Penn State, um, Hank Foley, and uh, Hank thought it might be helpful. And so we had, a, if you think about it, staff is getting inundated every day with negative news for weeks and months. It takes a toll on your staff. And are you going to lose some of your best people? So you really got to address almost in a counseling sort of way, how to address that. And that's one of the great things Rod was able to do. We had people saying, you need to shut down the campaign. It's never going to be the same. And we said, hey, this we've got challenges, but I wouldn't trade with Penn State for anything right now. Honestly, they, their, their issues were ongoing and much more extensive. And so again, providing some perspective with your staff and then just giving them a forum to regularly communicate with each other, whether it's just social even, sometimes it is important to give them that outlet because they are in the eye of the storm. So let me let Rod comment on that as well. Yeah, I just make a general comment about the governing boards uh, and, and many governing boards, not exclusively, but many of them are composed of, of corporate leaders, uh, CEOs and so forth. And, and I think probably have a different uh, leadership style and decision-making model than, than we certainly are accustomed to in, in higher education, for example, in, in the nonprofit world. And I, and I kind of came to the conclusion there's a, there's a big difference between being a stockholder in a company and a shareholder in terms of the, uh, the affinity that you have uh, for your alma mater. And so while you, on the one hand, uh, you lo love your, uh, the appreciation of your Amazon stock, it's, it's a totally different and much more emotional, and I think heightened point of, of love and affinity that you would have for your alma mater. And I think there's a recognition uh, that uh, to, to need to appreciate those differences, uh, frankly, uh, as, as uh, decisions are made and so forth. Let me just talk briefly about uh, staff morale. Um, Caring, I, I, I believe from the very get-go uh, that caring for my team was the most important responsibility I had. And, and then um, uh, trying to rebuild the reputation of the institution was the second most important responsibility. We had many town hall meetings. I held many town hall meetings. Uh, we engaged in stress management consultants. Um, I sponsored educational seminars that actually had nothing to do with fundraising, but they had uh, more to do with uh, personal growth and development. Uh, just because I wanted to, to, to provide some, uh, some uplift, some morale builders uh, and, and do some things of a special nature. Um, and we finally, we, we, we also focused on, uh, if you go through something like this, you're gonna realize that there are some silver linings uh, in, in, in any kind of storm you go through like this. And so we really tried to lift those silver linings up and, and, and the success stories. And, uh, and I really talked to the staff about, you know, the, the strength that they all were developing, the professional experience that they were gaining uh, from scaling, you know, a, a, a mountain under very difficult circumstances. But um, and I'm proud to say that, well, people come and go in organizations and, um, and uh, because our situation was very severe, we had a lot of search firms calling our people. And really proud to say that we didn't lose a single staff person uh, during uh, our, our crisis because the work was too difficult and they want, they saw greener grass elsewhere. So, so I thought it was tremendous that, that, that we had that kind of uh, loyalty from the staff. Okay, uh, we've got about five minutes. So we've got a couple other topics and we've got a couple of data points. Um, I will say on the question about did we lose um, those donors who initially pulled back? We, we were able to get back about five of the 8 million uh, that was initially lost. And I will say there was a direct correlation for uh, those people who said, I will never give you another gift. We looked and most of them had never given. So there, there's a large portion of people who will complain a lot and they're not very uh, 
important donors to your institution. Uh, okay, la um, next, last issue really is around have the importance of having diverse voices and diverse perspectives at the table. Obviously, we had a major crisis that had a racial element to it, and we quickly determined we did not have enough diverse voices and perspectives. Uh, and if you have to wait until after the fact, it's too late. Um, I'm proud that Mizzou developed a lot of infrastructure and outreach in the aftermath of that crisis, but at the time we were not prepared for it. So I'll just say that and just say, I, I'm a true believer that diverse voices and diversity in general brings better idea. If the, you look at the data, it's clear that institutions that are more diverse and have diverse perspectives get better decision-making and are more productive. It, there's absolute link. Not only is that it's the right thing to do, but um, it, you know this is very clear to us, and we weren't prepared in that regard when the the crisis kicked off. So that's what I really wanted to share about that. Rod, any thoughts? Yeah, I would just share one, and, and to kind of reinforce Tom what you just said, I, I would just uh, uh, and, and I don't have any empirical evidence to to, to give you, but um, I believe we would have been benefited more if we had had more women in leadership positions at the highest levels of the university. Uh, and uh, there are lots of, you know, a lot of reasons I, I feel that way. Um, but anyway, um, uh, just to, uh, to just echo the, the diversity question. Um, Kelly, we're going to ask you to bring up uh, in the last three minutes, we have here a, a few slides that I think talks to uh, the importance of data. And, and hopefully we might leave you uh, with a little bit of encouragement uh, when we conclude this, that, um, that uh, both Tom and I ended up having uh, campaigns that uh, uh, met and exceeded their, their goals. Uh, but we wanna show you some of that data too. So, uh, so uh, Kelly, if you could bring that up, please. Yep, so I'll go for, if you back up one, Kelly, this is just illustrative of the kind of thing our staff received on a regular basis. You can see refund my tuition is the signature. You am failing leadership. This is the kind of thing that we are getting all the time. And so we just use that as an example. If you go to the next slide, this is, I mentioned earlier that we had various crises from Melissa Click to the football team boy. There were a number of people who were just extremely upset that the football team had threatened a boycott and they were ready to give up their season tickets forever. And so this is just a heat map in the first few weeks. Uh, well, you can see week 25, we still were getting calls and we kept track of the different kinds of questions we were getting to be able to give some sense of how, how is the data, is the controversy continuing or is it residing a little bit and uh, how we, who should be addressing which issue. Uh, so for instance, journalism staff was, we're addressing a lot of the Melissa Click questions. So Rod, I'll turn it over to you for your slide. Yeah, if we could go to the next slide. So, um, so uh, Penn State had, uh, you know, about every other year had surveyed its alumni attitudinal surveys and so forth. So, so we actually had a little bit of bench, uh, you know, uh, data, benchmark data to work with, um, but we really went into uh, a, a much more survey mode uh, when this happened. Uh, this first, and I'll show you, the next slide will show you that, but this, this slide, uh, somebody asked about, uh, you know, do people come back or how do people stay with you? So uh, uh, my alumni director and I had in the first 10 days about 4,000 emails, almost equally divided between the two of us. And, uh, you know, here is their reaction by the level of lifetime giving. Uh, we logged every message, uh, actually a couple doctoral dissertations came out of some of this data, uh, kind of coined, uh, you know, uh, my director, uh, coined the word big mouth, little wallet, uh, a little, little cute, quick there, but what, what it really means, if you look at those two boxes, people that gave us $25,000 or more lifetime, um, uh, there were 756 respondents uh, uh, at that level, 79% of their comments were constructive and supportive. Uh, if you go all the way to the bottom, uh, no giving at all to Penn State, um, uh, there were uh, 444 responses, 66%. So two thirds of the people who had never given the university their, their first dollar 
were negative, whereas 80% basically who were major donors uh, were, were positive. So, so people, uh, people um, that trust you, know you well, it, it argues uh, to volunteers and getting to have people inside the institution. They tend to stick with you. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, um, this gives you just a real quick uh, sense about uh, the impact that we took in terms of commitments to the campaign. So we were uh, coming off the, the best year that the campaign had had and, uh, and uh, the best year it had had, had ever um, at 353 million. So what happened, that drop of 200 to 223 million, it, it, it essentially meant that we were not, we were out, we saw more people, we made more personal calls the year of the crisis uh, than we had ever made before, uh, but we were not in a mode of being able to put proposals in front of people or close proposals that people were holding. And so that was really because people wanted to talk about the crisis and were waiting to see how the institution was going to make it through the, these, these dark days. Uh, and as you can see then the uptick, the last year of the campaign, $342 million. So it, it, uh, it, it was a dip, but it was a momentary dip. Uh, and then there's one last slide here I want to show you. Um, uh, one of the things, those of you who have some marketing background or sales and experience uh, know something called the net promoter score, a uh, pretty typical question that's asked. Um, and the question is, how likely would you be to recommend Penn State to a prospective undergraduate of your own interests or backgrounds? Uh, and uh, at the end of 2024, the crisis took place in November of 2011. So in May of 2012, that net promoter score was at 50. It dipped then to 48, uh, and that was after NCAA sanctions and uh, many more things had occurred. But by the time we got to the end of the campaign and passed it, we were at 59, which is an extremely high net promoter score uh, most uh, most advertisers would love to, uh, and, and people that sell products would love to have a net promoter scooter like that. So the moral of the story here is, is that you really can uh, recover from a crisis. Um, it takes a lot of work, but but uh, but having data and making decisions that are factually based, uh, creating communication messages that are based in in what you know, what people are telling you, uh, empirical data versus what you think you know. Um, I had to actually convince the governing board to do these surveys. They were very reluctant to go out uh, and, and do these attitudinal assessments. But I think at the end of the day, we got a sense of, of, how, uh, of how, how big an issue this was. And uh, uh, in concentric circles, the farther you moved away from the, the, the heart of central Pennsylvania where Penn State is, outside the state and so forth, um, the news was better and better, you know. So, uh, so I, I would highly recommend, uh, you know, survey data uh, collection and so forth in these instances. So I'm just gonna do a couple of wrap up remarks, but please, uh, Rod, you've got a question in there. So look at that while I'm doing my concluding remarks and we'll be glad to stay around a little while longer if you have Q and A, so please continue uh, adding to those. Um, what I wanted to say, just to Rod's point about data, is um, we found over time, and we both experienced this, that there became a rallying around the, uh, the flag at some point. Um, it, it's almost as if you might have heard the expression, you can say what you want about me, but don't say it about my family. And, you know, to Rod's point, over time, well, we had that initial flood of pulling um, campaign gifts, et cetera, and the negative flow in the campaign, all kinds of uh, kind of things going on. We had one of our better years that next year. Uh, and again, it was the rallying of the flag and um, just a uh, team approach to communication. And I think again, looking, sometimes when you're in the middle of the crisis, it looks like it'll never get better and realizing that there are positive outcomes out there are really important. And the last thing I'll just say is around the governing board and just uh, language. So as Rod talked about with data, you know, most corporate people would understand you need data to make good decisions. And that's something that Grinzenbach Gleer does a really amazing job at, I'll just plug. But also around the idea of customers. We had a lot of people that said, why are you letting students do this, they're, they are out of line, just crack the whip and make it happen. And we tried to explain 
that you don't have to agree with everything about your customers, but if you're, you have a, a group of customers who are really upset and concerned, you would wanna listen to them and understand their perspective. And that really helped change the discussion around, well, you just weren't tough enough, no one was in charge, to the idea around seeing students as customers and as Rod said, shareholders. So um, those are a couple of closing remarks I wanted to make and uh, Rod, I'll let you do your wrap up and also address the question. Yeah, there was a question here, uh, and I think I answered the one about the no giving that uh, to Penn State. That was no giving lifetime to Penn State. But there was a question earlier that I think is an important one, and that was, um, uh, this is from a person says, we are experiencing some supporters saying that they will withhold future giving as a statement against issues around the university. Yet our top priority is student scholarships. Uh, what tactics were successful or not for you in helping to disassociate the crises from giving in support of students? Um, you know, we were, uh, sometimes we, uh, you know, I, truly the, the, the message, the overwhelming message of the campaign and that the, actually the campaign was about students uh, it was the whole full title was for the future of the campaign for Penn State students. Sometimes we don't really maybe I know we agonize a lot about all the right words and so forth. But um, but the the time that we spend actually thinking about what that meant, what the campaign uh, title and naming meant to the institution and uh, the values of the institution and that we were putting students uh, front and center uh, really resonated with people. So we we really. Um, uh, I had quite a number of conversations with donors actually that where I, I, I evoked the name of the campaign and I evoked the importance of students and I evoked the fact that wouldn't you want uh, students now and in the future have to, to, to have the same kind of experiences that, that, that you had when you were here as a student. Uh, and so we really uh, tried to, and I actually in turn then had students say, you know, I'm, you know, uh, quote, mad as hell, but I'm not going to penalize the students uh, by withholding my support. Um, and sometimes students can be really great advocates. Uh, we have a student run uh, phone program uh, at, at Penn State. And there was only one day throughout the entire course of the crisis where we did not make phone calls. We gave students the option to say, if you don't want to call, don't. But we wanted to have that continuous online dialogue. We're, we weren't raising, obviously, as much money during that period of time. But that was just one more channel where we could listen to hear what people were talking, uh, were, were, were telling us and what they were talking to students about. And frankly, I think the students uh, reassured some of the donors, uh, you know, in, in, in terms about their own, uh, their own livelihood. So Colleen had a question about, curious about the response from women versus men at Penn State and people of color versus white donors at Mizzou. Did you see a notable difference? And for us, yes, we did because, and this is, goes around the issue about how you talk about a crisis because many of our alumni of color, first of all, the, the thing that they told us that all of them had stories, even if going back to the fifties all the way through, they had stories of racial concerns and yet they still loved Mizzou. And for many of them, some of the changes we made at Mizzou at, for the donor, um, the alumni of color were really positive and they didn't see this crisis. They saw these students as heroes and students, many of them did. I'm not saying there was a monolith, but many of them saw the students as, you know, this is a great example of what you can do when you come together. And so we had to talk, uh, we had to talk about this and encourage the board not to talk about it in these glowing negative terms. We had to talk about it in a different way because of that. Um, but yes, we did definitely saw a different approach and a different response. Roger. There's question, yeah, there's a question here about that. We see any difference in response between men and women at Penn State. Uh, I, I'd say no, uh, we, 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 we did not. Um, and another question, did, did, uh, did the donors and volunteers that pulled back initially, uh, did they eventually come back around? Um, uh, the answer to that really is, is yes, for the most part, yes. Um, and uh, uh, we had uh, about 3,000 people that asked to be taken off the, 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 the roster, if you will, to say, you know, don't send me anything more, don't call me, nothing. Uh, and what we did after about two years time, when things began to come down, we started to begin to feed uh, those names back in uh, actually. And, uh, and we saw that, that those people who were, 
many people just at the at the moment we had a, uh, in our, our case we had two or three triggers that just created huge emotional fires and so people just uh, viscerally just said i'm finished with you folks um and you know time does heal many wounds not all of them uh but these people did come back um and uh, uh emotions calm down and and so sometimes that spur of the moment email that you get um you'll get a different response if you wait you know six 12 24 months yep so i just want to acknowledge the anonymous attendee who had a terrible experience at mizzou um and and is still not given so i'm sorry that was your experience and i i understand and uh empathize and you know, we did experience that from some of our alums as well. As Rod said, there are some that, you know, we'll never give again. So everyone experiences these uh, controversies a little bit differently and um, certainly respect your perspective on that. I'm sorry that was your experience. So um, I've got now 1241. And um, again, if you have other questions, Rod and I are glad to um, stay around for as long as you have questions, but looks like we're kind of wrapping that up. And I just want to, um, again, one of the last things I'll say is just the importance of um, persistence. Uh, it's tough when you're going through these uh, experiences because whether, no matter how you feel about it personally, you're dealing with tons of people. And we had an incredible campaign kickoff and then felt like a lot of the, the work that we had done was going down the tubes. And so, um, but over time, you're gonna be successful. And remember, it's gonna change, as Rod said, people's perspective changes over time and uh, continue to work on that. So um, anyway, Rod, any other closing remarks for you as we wrap up? I don't think so. Uh, you know, I, I, and I think the message is, is that, uh, um, Institutions and people are resilient. Uh, I was just really amazed that, um, you know, well, it was difficult to, uh, the work for us and for our development staff could not have been more difficult, frankly, but they were really resilient. Um, they really came together as a team and, and institutions that have been around for 150 years and so forth, like the Mizzou's and Penn State's of the world, um, they're pretty resilient too. Uh, and so, uh, so there is, um, they're, they're uh, I mean, I think these are at the, at the end of the day, while we went through some very difficult times at these two institutions, um, they also do represent success stories in the context of, of uh, you know, really achieving some pretty uh, uh, extraordinary uh, campaign goals and, and doing it on time and, and, and despite the difficulties that we encountered. Thanks, Rod. So, and I want to thank everyone for joining us. We had a great uh, group of attendees. And I wanted to say, finally, uh, Grinzenbach Glear would love to work with you. One of the things we bring to the table is data. And Rod and I are, if you have an experience like this, and most institutions do during the course of a campaign, I'm thinking about our colleagues at LSU and others who've dealt with some serious, um, even deaths in the family. Um, we are there to continue the conversation and um, would love to you know, engage with you, all of you. So thanks again for your attendance and uh, we'll look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you.